And... All right. Yeah, so welcome to uh, CS201 uh, Computer Science Department Seminar. Uh, so uh, today, uh, it's my great pleasure to have our own uh, Dr. Zhe Chen uh, to uh, give talk about his research. Uh, so Zhe, uh, he is uh, currently a postdoc research associate uh, under the supervision of Professor uh, Jason Chong from our department, as well as Professor uh, type of life from the uh, Department of Psychology. Uh, just current uh, research interest uh, spans closed loop systems for neuroscience, uh, reconfigurable and customized computing for domain specific applications. Uh, he uh, was the recipient of the UCLA Chancellor's Award for uh, postdoc research in 2019 and also a recipient of the UCLA Depression Grand Changing Fellowship in 2016. And his work also receives many other uh, best paper award as well as best student uh, paper award in uh, some conferences. And uh, yes, so it's my uh, great pleasure and uh, please join me uh, in welcoming uh, Zhe to give a talk. Uh, Zhe, okay. the stage is yours. Thank you, Professor Chen. Uh... Gu, yeah, Professor Gu. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. I, I would like to uh, start my presentation. Uh, today I'd like to share uh, with all of us uh, about our recent work on customized computing for close to feedback neuroscience application. Um, so I'd like to uh, start with this talk uh, by sharing a historical view of the um, neural recording technique. So since the first uh, uh, single neuron uh, neural recording was introduced in 1957, a uh, tremendous improvement has been made uh, in neural recording technique from the um, single unit recording to micro electrode array and from the silicon probe to Cauchy imaging microscopy. The number of simultaneous recorded neurons that uh, increases in at an exponential rate doubles approximately every seven years. So today we are able to monitor hundreds or even over a thousand neurons um, at the same time uh, in vivo. Uh, and uh, in a potential future, scientists anticipate that we are able to monitor a million neurons simultaneously while well, we are able to stimulate up to uh, 100,000 of them. So among all of the neural recording techniques, so miniaturized causing imaging uh, microscopy is probably one of the most uh, advanced and fast evolving techniques. Uh, as you can see a photo shown here on the bottom right, uh, such a miniaturized causing imaging device uh, is uh, implanted at a front head of a mouse, while the mouse is able to freely behave in a lab environment. So in Cauchy imaging, when a neuron fires, it will generate a Cauchy fluorescence that can be captured by a CMOS image sensor. So with, uh, within uh, about 10 minutes recording of Cauchy imaging, so you probably can uh, identify hundreds or even thousands of uh, cells within um, uh, hundreds of micrometer by hundred micrometer field of view. Mm, thanks to the open source efforts uh, from uh, Professor Daniel Haroni here at UCLA, this miniscope uh, technique has been uh, widely adopted uh, by hundreds of neuroscience research labs across the world. So among all of the uh, world's leading neural recording techniques here uh, developed at UCLA, I'd like to specifically uh, introduce uh, two types of neural recording sensors to you, uh, which are involved uh, with our project. The first is the assembly of touch volts. As you can see here on the left, uh, it has been able to uh, record uh, neural signals from, uh, from, uh, from a live rat. Uh, it can record local field potential signal and also EEG signals. So it can sense 128 channels of EEG signals. So each channel is sampled at uh, 32 kilohertz. Uh, the sensor on the right uh, shows the UCLA miniscope. 
Uh, actually, that is a, a series of uh, um, calcium imaging miniscope sensors uh, that have been success successfully demonstrated on real rats and mice uh, to capture calcium images in vivo. So the photo here shows specific uh, miniscope V3 sensor. It has a spatial resolution of 700 by 52 by uh, uh, 480 with a maximum frame rate of uh, 60 frames per second. Uh, thanks to the efforts uh, from Dr. Garrett Blair, we have demonstrated the capability to simultaneously record um, the EEG signals and the calcium imaging signals on rat while the animal is uh, running back and forth on a linear track. So with all of these uh, advanced neural recording uh, sensors at hand, a uh, natural question we'd like to ask is whether we can come up with some real-time online neural signal processing to close loop. Uh, and further, if we can integrating the computation with the sensing, that probably can help the neuroscientists with uh, uh, some design of new experiments to study how brain works. Um, but it, it turns out to be a challenging problem to solve uh, because the real-time neural signal processing has to meet three stringent requirements at the same time. First, the computation have to have a short latency in order for us to be able to generate a rapid feedback uh, stimulation. Uh, secondly, the computation had better to have er high energy efficiency in order for the computation to run for days or even weeks uh, based on a single battery. Uh, especially when you consider the integration case. Uh, finally, uh, it's better to um, have some flexibility for reconfiguration for the computation so that it will benefit the adaptation for unique subject in a lab environment. So the selection of hardware platforms to enable this real-time neural signal processing can be made uh, between general purpose GPO, CPOs, and uh, programmable FPGAs and ASICs. So if we consider a typical um, processing task, uh, assume we have uh, 128 EEG channels and each EEG channel is sampled at uh, 32 kilohertz and assume one sample requires 600 operations to complete the computation, then we have this uh, about uh, 2.46 uh, G, uh, G ops uh, this workload. Um, a modern uh, low power GPU platform can handle this uh, workload um, well pretty easily. However, due to its high power consumption, the accumulated heat can easily generate, uh, can easily break the limits of two degrees centigrade. So besides that, considering uh, the other features like a determinist timing, flexible IO interface, physical, uh, compact physical size and the reconfigurability required by the real-time processing system, we thought that uh, using an FPGA or ASIC platform is a better choice for this application. So in this talk, uh, I would like to focus on introducing our work on customized computing for closed loop feedback on the FPGA device. I will break down the introduction into two parts. First, I would like to introduce the real-time EEG signal processing, while the second part, I would like to introduce the real-time causing image processing. So before I dive into much detail of the EEG signal processing, uh, I would like to provide some uh, background of the EEG basics. So EEG is a type of a neural recording technique that has been um, widely used uh, in uh, neural recording. Uh, so uh, in humans and other mammals, uh, so the brain will generate uh, this uh, uh, rhythmic oscillations across different frequencies. So major EEG uh, frequency bands uh, can be um, named uh, by these uh, Greek characters. Like here show uh, the delta signal is uh, zero to four hertz. The theta signal is uh, uh, four to seven hertz and over 30 hertz uh, is called the gamma signal. So besides this, uh, uh, these uh, rhythmic oscillations, 
there are some EEG signals are transient signals, like the sharp wave ripple events, which is often detected uh, in the subject during sleep. So since um, critical information is, is often uh, encoded in specific phase of the EEG signal. So in this project, we aim at um, accomplishing real-time EEG signal processing for uh, all of these uh, EEG bands and types uh, for closed loop feedback stimulation. Uh, let me take a specific example, uh, four to seven hertz theta rhythm uh, as an example, uh, which uh, sometimes is observed when the rat is in motionless but alert state. So the right shows the um, signal flow of the EEG processing. Uh, suppose we have the raw 32 kilohertz raw EEG signal uh, like this. Usually we would first use a low pass filter and down sample to um, reduce the frequency to 160 Hertz for the theta horizon. And then we apply a direct current uh, offset filter um, to get the gray uh, uh, colored signal like shown here. And then we use the band pass filter to extract the theta horizon uh, like the blue curve. Uh, and then we use the Hilbert transform to add a 90 degree phase shift uh, for the blue curve to get the orange curve. Uh, and, and then uh, depending on this mathematical formula, we can uh, derive the phase and the amplitude information from this, uh, um, this blue and uh, this orange curve. And then based on that, we can generate stimulation, feedback stimulation by event detection. So suppose our goal is to uh, generate uh, feedback uh, simulation at every peak of the theta horizon. So these algorithms work um, perfectly offline when all of the signal are stored uh, on the disk. Uh, however, uh, when we apply this uh, same processing flow on a real-time processing, uh, in a real-time processing case, uh, the, 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 the situation is not always ideal. So usually we will observe this, uh, uh, the latency problem. This is caused by the causal nature of the IFIR and IFIR filters uh, because the bandpass filter and Hilbert transform are all implemented by the IFIR IR filters. So what, uh, so what is the causal nature? Basically it's a, uh, the current time steps output depending on a uh, future sampled input. So that will cause a causal delay. This is uh, hard to be uh, removed. Uh, and uh, it gave us this challenge, uh, how to reduce a causal delay to caused by the IFIR and IR filters uh, to solve. So the method we proposed is to use LSTM inference uh, for the EEG signal processing. Uh, the LSTM, which is short for long short-term memory, uh, it's a type of a recurrent neural network that has been successfully used in many temp uh, temporal prediction tasks like uh, lang language process uh, recognition, video captioning, and so on. So the LSTM model, um, typically it contains two types of uh, layers. Uh, the hidden layer and output layer, and four types of gates, uh, input gates, uh, forget gates, cell gate, and output gate, and two types of nodes, the uh, cell node and the hidden node. So, um, so the algorithm we propose is that we want to use a pair of LSTMs to uh, predict the filter results of the bandpass filter and the bandpass filter plus the Hilbert transform. Uh, during the offline training process, we will collect all of the EEG data and use the original signal flow to process the EEG signals and get the, the bandpass filtered and the Hilbert transform results. And then we will use those results as the teaching signal to train a pair of LSTMs to learn the relationship between the inputs and the teacher signal. Now, after the LSTM networks are trained, we will deploy this LSTM inference uh, on, online to predict causal prediction uh, um, uh, in place of the a causal uh, IR filters. So that can remove a causal delay. 
So let me uh, provide more detail about the LSTM training here. So we start from a training of LSTM from a relatively large uh, network size, 50 nodes, and gradually shrink the network size uh, and keep monitoring the accuracy. We find that uh, we can reduce the LSTM size down to five nodes uh, without losing uh, much accuracy. So this is the uh, output results uh, given by a five node LSTM inference uh, for the pair of LSTMs. As you can see, uh, the, the, the green curve shows the, uh, uh, the IR filter results, while the blue curve gave the LSTM inference results. So they match pretty well. And uh, uh, as you can see here, we go ahead to, to evaluate the uh, accuracy uh, by looking at the phase arrow uh, by using a six minute uh, recorded data set. So according to the evaluation, the phase arrow after collaboration uh, can be within uh, plus minus three degree, which is uh, good enough for uh, feedback stimulation. So more importantly, this method reduced the processing latency significantly compared to a conventional method based on uh, IR filters, which requires 12.5 uh, uh, milliseconds to complete the uh, EG processing. This method can reduce the processing latency to two microseconds. And in addition, it also uh, saves computation uh, operation accounts. So because we bypass the low pass filtering stage. So that's our algorithm. Uh, and then let's uh, introduce a, a circuit design to implement, uh, to implement this algorithm uh, efficiently. So the circuit we propose uh, is called uh, CLINK, which is short for Compact LSTM Inference Kernel. So this thing can be arranged in an uh, in a, in a array uh, that each element work in SMD fashion. And this link uh, uh, has two major modules inside. One is the MVM module, which is short for matrix vector multiplication. The other is the REC module, the recurrent state update module. So the update of LSTM gates and uh, the update of LSTM cell node and the hidden node and also output are mapped to the MVM and REC modules uh, res uh, respectively, as you can see here. So uh, let me introduce more detail of the circuit implementation. For the MVM design, uh, the idea is that we enroll the multiplications uh, for uh, all of the LSTM nodes. Suppose we have uh, N LSTM hidden nodes, and then we enroll the uh, the multiplication so that we this uh, mm, circuits can take n multiplications at one clock cycle, um, and also this implementation was uh, with a fixed p fixed point uh, 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 this data type. So all of the bit shifts are figured out through offline data range analysis. Uh, the lookup table for the nonlinear operations uh, is reused for both the hyperbolic tangent and the sigmoid uh, because we have this uh, mathematical uh, relationship here. Uh, and the REC design, uh, the main idea of this design is uh, we reuse the multiplier in this circuit for the update of uh, both LSTM cell node and hidden node and also the out output states. So uh, overall, we can keep this uh, utilization rate of the multiplier to be 80% throughout the LCM inference. So this is the timing diagram of the MVM on the REC modules. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, these two modules are uh, fan grain pipeline. So the number of iterations here corresponds to the number of hidden nodes in our LSTM uh, inference. So within each iteration, the MVM and REC modules take uh, four and five clock cycles uh, respectively. And you can see they are fully pipelined. So in order to make the uh, LSTM circuits to operate more efficiently, we propose the bit sparse quantization. 
So as you see, so here uh, it's based on the bit sparse representation. So uh, in this representation, suppose we have M binary digits, uh, we regulate that only N bits can be freely set to zero or one while the rest of bits have to remain zero. So uh, as you can see here, there are, this shows two example of the mm, two S bit number. So by using, by making use of this uh, data representation, uh, we can remove the uh, multipliers in the circuits and uh, replace those with uh, bit shift operators. Since the bit shift operators is much cheaper than the multipliers in the circuit implementation, by making this replacement, we can reduce the circuit area and the power consumption by almost 40% compared to the clink baseline. Uh, then we have the evaluation of the clink kernel in uh, ASIC design flow under the 15 nanometer process. Uh, and according to our evaluation, uh, this circuit design can outperform the uh, 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 LSTM inference kernel design on the IPGA by uh, 99 times and also reduce the processing latency by 95%. So in summary, we have proposed uh, LSTM based method uh, that is effective in removing a causal delay caused by FRIR filters in the EEG signal processing. And in addition, we propose a customized circuit design for high energy efficient EEG processing. Uh, and then I will briefly talk about the, our prototyping of the EEG processing on the IPGA. So this is the, our IPGA design. It uh, has uh, two uh, arrays. One is the EEG processing module array. The other one is a trigger pattern generator array. Uh, the first the EEG processing module array contains eight by uh, eight uh, eight e, uh, EPM modules. Uh, so each EPM module is based on the inference I introduced before and can, um, can share among uh, 16 different time slices. Each time slice is uh, mapped to a specific EEG channel. So in total, uh, as you can see, we can uh, support uh, 128 EEG input channels. Uh, and for the trigger pattern generator, we have uh, uh, two layers and each layer we have eight uh, trigger pattern generator units. Uh, so these 16 units are configured. We can generate uh, reconfigurable uh, uh, TTL patterns that can be used for feedback stimulation. This table shows the overall IPJ hardware cost uh, uh, on the low end IPJ device. So we integrate this IPGA design with uh, data acquisition front end and also the host computer. Um, so we also mm, developed a user interface uh, that can be used by end user to set the, the reconfiguration parameters for the IPGA for the 128 EEG channels. So this is um, uh, a short demo showing that um, uh, the real-time EEG signal processing based on LSTM inference uh, can be realized in real time. Uh, the green bar shows the stimulated uh, patterns. So with that, I uh, have introduced uh, the um, brief introduced the EEG signal processing efforts. And next, I would like to move on uh, to introduce the real-time causing image processing. Um, so this photo shows the UCLA, latest the UCLA miniscope. So it's called LFOV, which is short for Large Field of View Miniscope. Uh, this, type, this sensor can monitor neural activities at large in vivo. So it has the resolution, space, spatial resolution of uh, uh, 1296 by 972 and the temporal resolution of 22.8 frames per second depending on which uh, brain region you are looking at. So this sensor can monitor uh, hundreds of cells uh, in vivo. This figure shows um, max projection of cell contours uh, on a cropped uh, uh, causing image. 
So there are a few um, offline housing image analysis pipeline that's uh, commonly used. One is called the Cayman, and the other one is the LSTM assisted housing image analysis, which is called a mini pipe. So these two algorithms, they have a common uh, this uh, procedure that is called a uh, CIN MFE, uh, shorted for extended constraint and negative matrix factorization. This common algorithm, uh, it has a complexity, linear complexity. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's proportional to the number of uh, uh, pixels and the number of frames. Uh, although it's very scalable, uh, but this is uh, batch processing. Basically, it requires all of the Cauchy images to be stored on a disk, and then you can put the stack of images to the pipeline and then start the processing. So it's a purely offline uh, analysis algorithm. It's hard to be deployed uh, online for real-time processing. So it's still a very challenging problem for real-time Cauchy image processing for closed loop feedback. And I ask a question about this uh, oh, sure. calcine imaging uh, sure. technique. So is this uh, like an invasive technique or non-invasive? So do you need to plug in a, like a probe or something into the, the brain of the, the mice? Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is, uh, uh, this is an intrusive technique. Yeah, you uh, mm -hmm. re usually require some kind of surgery to uh, embed this sensor. Uh, I see. And then uh, after a few weeks, then the experiments can start. Okay, I see. I see. Thanks. For so so uh, so these uh, real time processing, they have some uh, specific strict uh, demand. Uh, first is uh, it requires the Cauchy image processing to have a short and deterministic latency, uh, and also if we consider uh, integrating the computation with the sensor then usually you'll have very limited hardware resource to leverage, especially considering some very recent neural recording technique like a voltage imaging, uh, which can operate uh, at kilohertz frame rate. Uh, the, yeah, these become more challenging for close to put feedback. So our goal for this project is want to realize real-time Cauchy image trace extraction uh, with uh, spike timing precision, which is uh, one millisecond. So I'd like to start introduction of the, uh, our uh, results uh, by first looking at the motion correction. So as you can see here in the raw video, there are a lot of uh, motions there. So, so the first uh, and critical, most critical uh, processing step for most of the Cauchy image analysis pipelines is the motion correction. So the challenging part is that uh, during the recording, there are a lot of the non-uniform motion artifacts caused by the movements of the brain tissue. And the uh, conventional algorithm, when they solve this uh, uh, non-rigid motion, uh, this algorithm is usually costly and inefficient. So the motivation of us is to realize real-time non-rigid motion correction for causing imaging. So this slide shows the processing flow for the original uh, non-rigid motion correction. First, uh, an input frame of image will mm, be filtered by a 2D contrast filter, uh, usually with a template size like this 17 by 17. This, this size depends on the cell di diameter in the image. So after the bulk of the background has been removed, uh, so the image are uh, uh, divided into overlapping patches. For example, here we have 22, uh, 24 patches. So for each image patch, uh, it will be uh, matched with a template and uh, to calculate uh, uh, the cross correlation map. Uh, and from the cross correlation map, we find uh, uh, the local maximum and use this uh, location of the local maximum to derive the motion vector and use those motion vector to calculate, uh, to correct the, the image, to stabilize the image. So as you can see here, the challenge is that we need to uh, repeat the same amount of computation for every patch. 
So this algorithm becomes very costly and inefficient, uh, especially consider real-time implementation. So the algorithm we propose is to use uh, LSTM inference for this non-rigid motion correction. So the idea is that uh, instead of uh, uh, calculating motion vectors for every patch, uh, we just uh, calculate uh, the motion vector for a center patch and then use that uh, vector, motion vector, uh, to predict the motion vectors of the rest of the patches. So, um, so we train LSTMs to implement that. So during the off offline training, we collect uh, the data set and use the conventional non-rigid motion correction algorithm to train the LSTM networks to learn the relationship between the center patch and the rest of patches. So after the LSTM networks are well trained, we deploy the LSTM um, networks online uh, and for uh, incoming frame of image, we just uh, perform rigid motion correction for the center, center image and then send that motion vector to all of the LSTM networks and let those LSTM networks to predict. So what a motion vector are for the rest of patches. So in this way, we, we reduce the number of operations to, uh, by 95%. So we also evaluate the accuracy of the proposed LSTM method. We used the residual optical flow to estimate the accuracy of the algorithm. It turns out the, the accuracy achieved by the LSTM method um, is very similar as the non-rigid motion correction. And uh, as you can see here, uh, it uh, looks better, much better than the uh, original rigid motion correction. So by combining this uh, LSTM based method with the FPGA accelerator design, uh, we can achieve significant uh, speed up and the energy efficiency gain over the CPU uh, uh, evaluation of the non uh, traditional non-rigid motion correction algorithm. So in summary, uh, by combining the LSTM method and IPGA acceleration, we finally achieve the real-time causing image non-rigid motion correction. So uh, on top of uh, the motion correction, we uh, propose a complete um, causing image processing pipeline for closed loop feedback stimulation. So this is our proposed uh, algorithm pipeline. It consists of uh, three processing steps. The first one is the motion correction. The second one is the image enhancement, which is uh, uh, made up of uh, the morphological erosion and the dilation filterings. Uh, and the third step, the motion, uh, trace extraction uh, is based on uh, cell contours uh, extracted offline by the CNMFE method. So we map this three processing stage uh, onto the FPGA hardware uh, as separate uh, accelerators. So the operation of these accelerators uh, follow this uh, timing diagram. So as you can see, a large part of the uh, uh, computations, for example, the motion correction and the uh, image enhancement can overlap with the um, image readout. So we, did that, we defined the, uh, the, uh, the latency of the causing image processing as the, the starting point as the end of the image readout and the ending point is the end of the trace extraction. So by overlapping uh, the, a large part of computation with the image readout, we can reduce the latency a lot. Uh, and also since our processing is a, a, a streaming type of processing and we use a on-chip buffer to, remo uh, to remove the off-chip uh, data access, we remove, uh, we save a lot of memory, memory cost. Uh, so I'd like to uh, introduce a little more detail about the um, uh, accelerator implementation detail. Uh, the first one I would like to highlight is the, uh, the folding architecture we proposed. Uh, this folding architecture can leverage the central symmetry of uh, filter kernels 
which is often used, for example, in contrast filtering or erosion and dilations. So basically, um, you can see that by, by exchanging the order of the addition and the multiplications, uh, we can save computation resources. We can save uh, over 80% LUT flip-flop and over 60% of DSP by using the folding architecture compared to a design without using folding. Uh, another accelerator uh, I'd like to introduce is the, uh, this uh, tracing accelerator, uh, which is a scalable design making uh, uh, com composed of uh, these uh, processing elements in a 1D systolic array. So it will, um, it will take uh, the scan uh, image pixel, one pixel per cycle at this uh, throughput. And each, each uh, processing element uh, contains information for eight different cells. So for each cell, it has the center information, position information, and also the contour information. The contour is uh, 25 by 25 binary mask. So these eight cell information are stored in the local BRAM of the tra tracing element. Uh, in this way, we can avoid uh, a lot of off-chip memory access uh, to improve the runtime and also reduce the energy cost. So then based on this tracing accelerator, uh, 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 we propose the three latency optimizations. So the first optimization is called region segmentation. So uh, on the top row, uh, this shows the original uh, way of doing the scanning. So suppose our tracing accelerator um, is reused by four times. So and uh, for, each, for each iteration, uh, the image, the whole image will be scanned because the, the cells are distributed evenly in the image. So by, by sorting the um, cells into different regions, uh, in each iteration of scanning, we can, uh, we can reduce the, the scanning time, right? We can only scan this part of the image. So in this way, we can reduce a lot of uh, runtime and uh, achieve speed up. So the second uh, observation is that uh, when we scan the image, we find uh, a lot part of the image uh, actually are background. So in those regions, there is no information like uh, trace values to be accumulated if we uh, input a background pixel into the tracing accelerator chain, it actually make no difference. Mm. So that is a waste of uh, computation. So the idea is to uh, skip over those background pixels during uh, our scan. So we design a circuit to enable the faster forward. Uh, the idea is that since all of the cell contours are offline, we can analyze the location of the contours and generate the starting and ending point um, for each row. And then we can st store those information in the local BRAM. And then when we scan the image, we keep fetching the information from the BRAM and then skip over the background pixels. So the third optimization method is uh, double buffering. So uh, originally we have one long chain of the tracing elements. So in this optimization, we split the tracing uh, chain into two parts. And then uh, with two chains, we can overlap the processing with the loading and the storing so that you can see the loading and the storing time can be hidden behind the processing. So in this way, we can further reduce the uh, the, the runtime and achieve speed up. So with these three uh, latency optimizations uh, combined, we can reduce the processing latency down to less than one millisecond. While we do not have incurred uh, significant overhead increase. Uh, so uh, that is our design on the FPGA. And then I would like to show you uh, some uh, prototyping without uh, on the IPGA. So this is the customized hardware we built for the IPGA platform, the interface PCB that can interface with the data acquisition board and also the host computer. Uh, on the host computer, we built this uh, um, uh, software terminals for the user 
for visualization purpose. So this demo show um, a real demonstration uh, on the FPGA for the for the motion correction. Uh, the video on the left shows the, the raw video without any motion correction, while the video on the right shows the motion after motion correction uh, results. Uh, the vectors on the bottom of the slide shows the, uh, <clears throat> the, the motion vectors calculated for each frame. So as you can see, a lot part of the motion can be removed and corrected during the real-time motion correction process. And this is a demo showing the real-time uh, cell trace extraction. Uh, so uh, the, the terminal shows the real-time uh, motion-corrected uh, calcium images uh, with uh, superimposed uh, cell contours. So we select the 63 cell contours and uh, display the cell traces extracted from these, those cells. Uh, on the hardware, we are able to extract in total uh, 1,024 cells uh, while keeping the processing latency uh, less than one millisecond. Uh, so with that, uh, I've introduced our work uh, uh, in completing the second loop for the causing image processing. Uh, and finally, I'd like to speed, uh, spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, some future uh, directions that uh, could enable the bioresisting work. So the first is the uh, observation that there's a trend that people are caring about uh, uh, energy efficient edge computing for example, here, there are two accelerators proposed for uh, LSTM inference for speech recognition task. The first one used uh, six, eight to 16 bit quantization for LSTM inference. Uh, the second one used a more aggressive six bit, six bit uh, weight quantization and uh, combined it with a structure proning optimization. Mm. So, so uh, our proposed method is based on a different uh, quantization. So it's a bit sparse quantization. Uh, and I evaluated that with a combination of pruning. And with that, we thought it has a um, potentially uh, can achieve better uh, energy efficiency um, trade off with the accuracy. So by comparing uh, that design with uh, Clink our baseline across uh, different uh, EEG and causing imaging data set. Uh, we evaluate that uh, the accuracy, uh, the circuit area and power can be reduced by about uh, 50%. A second direction that is uh, very interesting is the uh, uh, causing image decoding. A lot of people are uh, investigating uh, if we can decode the information from the causing images. So some people looking at uh, the code uh, for limb reaching of, uh, of a mouse uh, from the causing images. But some other people uh, looking at uh, the code, the behavior states of, the, of, a, of a mouse on a linear track. Uh, so the methods they use are the KN clustering and uh, Laplace Hagen maps. So uh, they have achieved a very impressive results uh, but those mm, algorithms uh, run purely offline. It's hard to uh, be deployed uh, on real time for close to uh, applications. Uh, so we are looking at uh, if we can achieve uh, cause image decoding uh, in real time uh, for a decoding, position decoding task for a rat. Uh, basically decode, take input uh, from the every frame of image and generate predicted positions uh, for that frame. We have explored a variety of uh, decoders, including the linear classifier, uh, CNN, and the uh, spiking neural network, SNN. And uh, we observe a uh, trade-off uh, feature of the SNN, um, that is the trade-off is between the accuracy, decoding accuracy, and inference time steps. Um, Basically, as we reduce the time steps of the LCM inference, we sacrifice a little bit accuracy, but we can, uh, we can reduce the processing latency. 
So there is another quick demo showing the real-time um, decoding um, we implement on the FPGA for, for the rat's position. The blue, uh, the blue curve shows the ground truth position of a rat on a linear track, and uh, the orange curve is the decoded position in real time. Um, and finally, I think uh, looking in the into the future, I think uh, there is a, a, a wide spectrum uh, of the applications that can, uh, can, can benefit from the close collaboration between uh, the computing engineering and the, the neuroscience um, that's, that can impact fields like uh, medication and also robotics. And we could ask many questions and most uh, uh, general question could be, whether we can build better electronic system that assist in the discovery of uh, neuroscience, new neuroscience. And the other question is uh, whether the knowledge we learn from neuroscience can get us to build a future, uh, more energy efficient computing and electronic system. So I think there are a lot of opportunities here um, when we collaborate with uh, uh, neuroscience in this uh, the interdisciplinary field. And finally, I'd like to take a chance to thank my supervisors and the collaborators, uh, also the support uh, from the funding agencies, including the NSF and the NIH. And with that, uh, I finish uh, my talk. And if you have any questions, uh, welcome to uh, let me know. And very thank you for for your listening and interests. All right, thank you for the great talk. Thank uh, you. Now let's take uh, questions uh, from audience. Yeah, so at the beginning of talk, there's a clarifying question about what is a neuron uh, image imaging. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. can you explain it? I, I think that the, uh, oh. it's become much clearer now, but uh, do you have some like, comment on that? So, is neural imaging a very broad concept or it's a very specific technology? Do you have uh, any comment on that? Uh... Uh, so, 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 so this is, uh, yeah, this is a very emerging, uh, I think, uh, uh, neural recording technique, um, mm -hmm. that, that has many, uh, different, uh, you know, subcategories, uh, such as one photo, one photon imaging, two photon imaging and, uh, confocal imaging. So, uh, we're looking at the in vivo, uh, one photon causing imaging. So for this type of imaging, uh, the device can be made very uh, miniaturized and okay. can be implanted on um, the head of a, a rodent uh, that can support uh, neuroscientists to uh, record these images uh, in, 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 in real time, in vivo. Um, and our contribution is to uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, build computing system that can assist the real time uh, housing image analysis, uh, potentially to enable the close feedback based on these uh, imaging techniques. I see, I see. And in your, this uh, so-called closed loop, uh, uh, recording or, or information processing uh, framework, uh, there's uh, both EEG uh, signal as well as the recording uh, signal. I wonder, yeah. do you need to synchronize these two signals or they can be asynchronous? Oh, currently, yeah, that, that's uh, that's very uh, interesting point. Uh, currently, we are uh, analyzing uh, those signals um, separately. Uh, for example, in our demonstration, we use IPGA to uh, focus one specific uh, mm, this, uh, uh, new, new recording modality at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, but potentially in the future, uh, since in the lab, these, uh, these two type of sensors can work together 
when when we do the recording. So potentially in the future, uh, we'll, we, sh uh, we should expect that we are able to uh, take in both uh, kind of uh, uh, neural signals and then process them together. And yeah, there is a chance that we can synchronize them and that will be very interesting to see if one type of recording can assist the other type of image, uh, imaging and can generate uh, uh, more information from that synchronization. I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, that's what I, also what I thought because if, uh, for example, this segment of the EG signal correspond to a uh, subset, a sequence of, for example, imaging you uh, captured from uh, the calcium uh, imaging process, then these uh, two sources of information might be uh, fused or integrated uh, maybe in a better way so that uh, uh, maybe weak signal can be reinforced into strong signal so that you can uh, extract more uh, subtle or uh, like uh, small signals that could be useful for your uh, downstream task. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. The, the calcium imaging is uh, in higher spatial resolution, but lower temporal resolution. And the EEG is the opposite. It has a lower spatial resolution, but higher temporal resolution. So these two, two sensing techniques are compensating with each other. So if we integrate them together, we should expect um, the better performance in the sensing, yes. Yeah, thank you. Any other yes. questions from audience? Uh, feel free to raise your hand or, yeah, I think it's good to ask now uh, instead of uh, typing in the Zoom chat. So you, you can just raise your hand and I will unmute you. Yeah, so it looks like uh, there's no more question. Uh, and, and I guess probably because this is very like a multi uh, disciplinary uh, research, uh, it's really uh, great. But on the other hand, maybe most of people here are from computer science department. So uh, we need to spend more time to understand the, 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 the psychology uh, component of this one. So yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. the recording of this talk will be uh, released online. And uh, for many of you, if you are interested, you can uh, watch it again. Or if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with uh, Dr. Zhu Chen. OK, so with that, uh, let's thank uh, Zhu again for his great talk. Uh, thank you, Zhu. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Professor Gu.